to the way on International Women's Day. Yes. Woo. Woo. I'm not going to lie. The news this week, the political machinations of the United States of America really had me feeling some kind of way. And when like the first version of this sermon came to me, it hit me at like one in the morning and I literally like preached half of it to my bookshelf in like fiery anger. I was like, ooh Lord, you're gonna have to revise this or I'm gonna have a job two weeks from now. So I think we got to a place where it's, uh, we'll find out. <laughs> So um, our scripture today comes from John 2, and it's actually the scripture that we're looking at within our Belong Circles series, and it's one that might be familiar to you, but let's read through it together. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to, his servants, to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, hey, 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 everyone brings out like the good stuff after everybody's like real drunk and won't notice that the quality of the booze has decreased. But you, you have brought out the tasty stuff here at the end of the wedding. That is the Erna International Translation. And when Jesus, um, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. All right, well, if you grew up in church, this might be a passage that you're familiar with. It's one of the seven signs that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John. It's also the source of many jokes by comedians that Jesus' first miracle was about making alcohol available at a party. Um, and I support that um, interpretation. Um, there are sermons about the fact that Jesus is a person who's not uncomfortable coming to parties, you know, to counteract that depiction of Jesus as too uptight to hang out with people. Um, it also talks about how Jesus brings the better wine at the end and that Jesus himself is the better wine. And so it's a symbol of the, of the better wine coming later. Um, and then there's sermons on the fact that the servants are the ones who see the miracle. Did you catch that? It's like the bride and groom, they don't know where it came from. The guy who's in charge of all the catering, he doesn't even know where it comes from. It says that the servants are the ones who know what happened and what m the miracle was. And I love that angle on this story because I really believe that it's those on the margins, those working hourly wages, those catering these here situations that get to be up close to the work of Jesus, that Jesus draws from the margins into the center of what he's doing. But I'm not gonna talk about any of those things. Um, I felt, like I said, some fire in my bones this week. And I'll be honest with you, I was, I was bothered by what with Elizabeth Warren dropping out of the presidential race. Now I don't want you to get all like, is she about to like just preach her own personal super biased political message? Yes, no, I'm just kidding, that's not what's gonna happen. <laughs> I was disappointed not because I think she was the answer. I don't think politics are the answer to all problems, but I do think they are the answer to some problems. And I don't think they're everything, but I also think they are something. And I think that Elizabeth Warren one of the things I appreciated about her was um, that there were lots of stories of her actually listening to people of color and being willing to admit that she needed to like change her mind about things. And also there are no stories about her grabbing people by the balls and sexually assaulting them. So that puts her ahead of a lot of candidates. Hello. <laughs> but what I saw happen to her, it's weird when you hear it reversed, but you know. <laughs> What I saw happen to her and what I saw happen in the Democratic primary, the reason I think it bothered me so much is because it's what happens to so many of us who are in spaces that claim to be progressive, spaces that, to cl that, that claim to care about diversity. 
And these are spaces, basically, let's say a position opens up and some hiring is gonna happen. We need a new executive director. We need a new professor. We need a new person in this role. And they'll be like, yes, we are gonna have a very diverse pool of people. There's gonna be women of color and people of color and so much diversity. And maybe that's how it starts out. But in the end, who gets the job? It be a man. Often a white man, very often an old white man. And because the Democratic Party is just mirroring this scenario, it felt very upsetting and triggering. And so it was beyond just Elizabeth Warren. It was like, because this is what happens in all these spaces that claim to care about us. In the end, they're in the same entrenched systems as these place people over here. It doesn't feel that different. I'm discouraged. The thing is, when, you, when, when men end up in these positions, they're like, but I support women in leadership. So I don't know how it happened. And then like the two dudes are looking at each other and like, we don't know how it happened. And I'll be like, I don't know how it happened. Patriarchy. So we're going to talk a little bit about patriarchy. And I want the brothers to stay with me. <laughs> All right. I know it can be easy when you have like a woman who's like, I'm going to talk about patriarchy now to be like, <laughs> and internally to go fetal into the fetal position. But I believe that patriarchy harms everybody. It doesn't privilege everybody, but it harms everybody. All right, I believe that patriarchy is toxic, as toxic for men as it is for women. And as we continue, we're going to talk about it. And so would you just stick with me, brothers? Will you stay with me? Yes. All right, we're going to do this together. So let's just make sure that we even know what we're talking about. So there's a couple of categories when we're defining patriarchy. So the state, the household, violence, paid work, sexuality, culture. So in a patriarchal context, in the government, women have less power, less representation. In homes, women tend to do more of the housework and spend more of their time raising children, in addition to doing work outside of the home. Mm -hmm. Violence, women are more prone to experience vi experiencing violence and sexual violence. And sexuality, women's bodies and sexuality are more likely to be treated negatively. And culture, women are more misrepresented in media and popular culture. So I feel like we can all agree that a system that devalues women and their voices and their humanity and their contributions, as well as imposing on men a narrow definition of what it means to be a man, is toxic to all of us. At its very basis level, patriarchy is the belief that men are better and more valuable and more competent than women. Now, you may not have grown up necessarily in a super patriarchal culture, but as someone who is Korean American, I myself did. And so um, it's, it's a big part of Korean culture not very long ago that the eldest son was for sure the most important child. It wasn't like something that you, it was like, you know how like sometimes people be like, I don't know, I sometimes sense that like my parents favor my sibling. In Korean culture, they're not even trying to hide it. They'd be like, yes, we do, the firstborn son. He's the most important one. That was true in my mom. There was, she had five sisters and one brother who was in the middle and our, the, her whole family revolved around him as the firstborn son. And even when I was born and coming up uh, with my, I was an only child, but I grew up with three boy cousins and it was the oldest boy cousin was, you know, we all orbited him. He was the, the little prince. And, um, <laughs> and even when I got married, I remember uh, my husband and I went out with my aunt and uncle for um, dinner or something, and there was leftovers, and they packaged it up, and uh, my husband was carrying them out of the restaurant. And my aunt literally grabbed the to-go bag and handed it to me, and she's like, that's your job. You carry that. That's not your husband's job. Now, that doesn't bother me because... I know I'm not married to a man who agrees with that worldview, so that can be a funny thing. But it lets you know that in the timeline of history, that's not very long ago that these frameworks were really, really explicit. Woohoo, patriarchy. Now, I know we can't separate patriarchy from white supremacy, 
Um, they're deeply, deeply intertwined, but I am going to talk more about patriarchy today. But I want to acknowledge that we experience patriarchy differently in different ethnic-specific communities, though. So like how I experience it when I go into my Korean Christian spaces is different than how black women experience patriarchy in black church spaces, which is different than how my Latina sisters experience it when they go into Catholic or to Protestant spaces in their places of belief. So it's intertwined with white supremacy, but then also patriarchy has sort of its ec ethnic specific expressions. It's just a web everywhere because oppression is creative and dynamic and ever evolving. But I think what can be really tricky is when you end up in spaces that say they value women, that claim they don't ascribe to patriarchy, Christian spaces that say they support women in leadership, what does patriarchy look like in a place that is saying the right thing? And so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, the, this came to my, I started thinking about this more because I was at a pastor's gathering not too long ago, and all these men pastors were talking about how they used to not support women in leadership, but now they do. And it sounded like the right thing to say, but as I was sitting in the meeting, I was like, but it doesn't smell good in here. It still smells like patriarchy. It still smells like white supremacy. Because even if people change their theological position up here, they haven't examined the fact that all the ways they exegete scripture are rooted in patriarchy. That when they were planting their church and sending up, setting up leadership structures, it was rooted in patriarchy. What, that, that actually had an impact on the generations of women that came up under them. And they haven't acknowledged the pain or the trauma that they caused to generations of women who were under that theology. And that they still run their churches with top-down, unilateral, you better do what I say, decision-making. And so even though they were saying they supported women in leadership, it smelled bad because it was all still patriarchy underneath. So, and it was unexamined. Does that make sense? And the, sa the same thing, and that's why progressive spaces feel so toxic to people of color. Because even if people say one thing, it's still built on systems of white supremacy and anti-blackness, and it's still built on patriarchy. And that's why progressive spaces can often be as toxic and traumatizing as conservative spaces. But it messes with your head more because they're saying something over here. So then you just feel all like, where's my therapist? So. <laughs> Unless we think these here United States, and I know we don't, but I'd just like to throw a little data at us. In the government, women have less power, less representation. Women are 23% of Congress. Um, however, there are only four women of color in the Senate. Four. Of the 435 people that represent us uh, in Congress, only 22 of them are black women. 12 are Latina, six are Asian Pacific Islander, one is Middle Eastern, and two are Native American. We know that representation matters, and we know what that limited representation is doing to our communities. Or in the households, in, you know, in, the, in the realm of, of the home, I was doing some research. Do you know that women who are raising children alone do less housework than women who are married to men and raising children? Think about it. <laughs> Now you would think, as a single mother, that she's carrying the burden, and so, no. But studies show that women who are married to men spend more time, do, and, and raising children, do more time doing housework than single women. Women who are married to women do not experience that. So it's specific to patriarchal expectations. I will note, however, that in, um, in families where black men are there fathering their children, they statistically spend more time bathing, diapering, dressing, and helping their kids on a daily basis than men of other ethnicities. Yeah. So I would like to <laughs> testify <laughs> and break some of those negative narratives that people try to tell about black fatherhood when they're showing up and doing it. So, so stop that. Um, <laughs> also, we know that Christian spaces, sometimes people say stuff like, patriarchy's out in the world, and then, like, and surprise, guys, sometimes it comes into the church. And I'll be like, surprise? The church is like the great perpetrator of this nonsense, right? It's out here peddling this stuff like Amazon. And so, um, 
It is estimated that about 10% of head pastors are women. But when women are head pastors, they get paid 27% less than men in the same, 27% less than men. And with a higher percentage of critical comments from the congregation. Now, I'm not saying, I mean, I feel like, of course, there's back and forth, and I'm not saying, and I'm not even saying that to be passive aggressive, because y'all at the, at the way are an incredibly supportive congregation. But I know this, like, I'll go speak at conferences and stuff, and I remember speaking at this conference, and just some, like, freshman guy coming up to me afterwards and, like, bringing me all this critique on my talk. And I was like, I sure enough know if I was a man, this would not be happening. It's not that I'm not open to critique, it's just that I know what is making him feel like he can say and talk to me like this. And he would never do that to an Asian American dude. He was Asian American, that's why I say that. Um, and I think just to Im it's important to acknowledge that patriarchy is not some abstract thing that's just in statistics, but it is incredibly dehumanizing and demoralizing and discouraging. Before fir first service, because I was preparing this um, sermon, all these instances of growing up where basically people said to me that my leadership was not important or uh, my role particularly in, in bringing a Christian leader was uh, less valued, not validated. I was like, am I gonna cry through this whole sermon? Because it's not just an abstract academic concept, it's stuff that impacts your soul. I also wanna say it impacts men Men are created to have a rainbow spectrum of emotions. But patriarchy says you only get to live in blue. Your whole range of emotions is blue. And that puts men into a small and toxic box as well. So you might be like, that's interesting. What does that have to do with the wedding at Cana? Fear not, friends, the exegesis cometh th your way. So let's go back to John 2 and take a look at the wedding at Cana and see how we can speak into this toxic, problematic framework. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Oh, was she? Hmm. Let's talk about it. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. What's Jesus' mother's name? Mary. Mary gets put into two very extreme frameworks that have been used to keep patriarchy in place. The first one will be more familiar to the folks coming out of a Catholic context, but Protestants are familiar with it and have adopted it. The first framework is Mary the Virgin, Mary the Sinless, Mary per forever pure. So the Immaculate Conception doesn't actually refer to Jesus being born sinless. The Immaculate Conception refers to Mary being born sinless because it was believed that she couldn't give birth to Jesus if she had any sin in her. And then it's that she was born sinless and then she remained a virgin forever. I really want you to think about that. <laughs> Meaning you can only partner with God if you are asexual and perfect as a woman. And that's a pretty oppressive standard to put onto women. You have to be sinless and sexless if you want to be a part of the story. And this is a very problematic yeah. interpretation of Mary. And even though Protestants act like they're not impacted by this view of, of Mary, actually this type of purity framework has oozed all over the place. So if you were in white evangelical spaces in the 90s, or if you were in any kind of evangelical spaces, I know it impacted women of color as well, there was this real resurgence of purity culture, which was this thing where it was like girls promised to stay virgins until they got married. And they would put on white dresses and do little weird ceremonies <laughs> where they basically promised their dad their virginity. What? what? Christians are so weird. We're so weird, and we act like it's normal. So do this, and then, but do you think that they also made young men do a purity ceremony and promise their virgin? No, no, because this kind of, this preoccupation with female virginity, when you have like an ethic that is like applied in such an imbalanced way, you know it's not a biblical ethic, you know it's an oppressive ethic, right? And so what is, what's happening here? <laughs> I think the problem with this purity virginity obsession is it basically says that a girl or woman's value is determined by whether or not she has sex. Think about this. 
It isn't measured by her moral or ethical choices. Her sense of self isn't rooted in her character, her relationships, how she relates to people, what she does in this world that creates impact. All that matters is not a thing she's choosing to do or who she is choosing to be. Her value is placed on one thing she's choosing not to do. That is what is problematic and toxic about purity culture. And it says that it's this irrevocable, uh, no, that word was too fancy, I shot too high. All right, it's this thing, <laughs> Icarus. All right, all right, come on back. Use vocabulary that's not too fancy for you, Erna. <laughs> but it, the analogy that they would always use was, it's like a piece of gum that's chewed up and then gets spit out, and you just can't be an unchewed up piece of gum again. What? This, but think about how evil that is to say to girls. That your, who you are is permanently forever changed by this one action. It doesn't matter anything else about your character. It doesn't matter anything else about your life with Jesus. It doesn't matter anything about how you're caring for your community or caring for your family or caring for people in this. All that matters is this one thing. But men be out here in these streets and that's great, right? <laughs> it's just... It's, The other thing we have to realize is that the purity paradigm is one that is uniquely applied to white girls and white women. We have to think about, because white supremacy and patriarchy live in a toxic marriage. And so you put white girls in this, they are the, pure, they are the ones that you must keep pure. But then, that is not something that Asian girls can be. That's not something that black girls are. That's not something that indigenous girls are. That's not something that brown girls are. And the reason that matters is so that when people perpetrate sexual violence against the bodies of black, brown, Asian, and indigenous girls, they don't need to feel guilty about violating purity because these girls were never put into that box. And that's why it creates a framework. And that's why we would be preoccupied with Britney Spears and her little commitment to virginity, but unconcerned with Aaliyah marrying R. Kelly at the age of 15. That's patriarchy. And that's a problem. That's why these frameworks of womanhood and saying that what makes Mary valuable is her sinlessness and her purity, we have to reject that. But then, Things swing to the other side. And maybe Mary's not, per, you know, this impure asexual thing. Mary becomes a sidekick. Just a fussy little lady with her little lady brain. <laughs> and this is how Protestants often talk about Mary. So we see it happen as the passage goes on. Eleven's feeling real energetic today. All right. So <laughs> When it says, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Now, most often, this gets read as Jesus dismissing his mother. It gets read as sort of like, woman, why are you bothering me? I'm over here trying to be about spiritual things, and you're over here worried about drinks. <laughs> right? Because in, even in spaces that say they value women, Women's concerns get dismissed as sort of insignificant, small lady stuff. Here's what's important. So this is this is um, this is what's important to know. This happens re repeatedly in how people exegete scripture. For example, there's a story of Mary and Martha, Jesus and his disciples. They all come to this woman's house, and Martha is concerned with how to feed this group of people. Instead of saying like, well, yeah, it's a culture based in hospitality. So being concerned about that makes sense. She gets dismissed. It's like, isn't it silly how ladies just always get concerned about the snacks? And Jesus over here trying to be, you know, so spiritual. It happens again and again and again. But there are some important things to know. 
Well, I will say this. The reason I think uh, John, John 2 gets interpreted this way is because I think the men who have exegeted this scripture, they view women that way. They, it is easy for them to imagine that Jesus' response to his mother is dismissive because they lay over their own patriarchal interpretation. And so we're, they're used to a narrative, like think about how every movie, the dude is the main character and the woman just, ex the woman experiences trauma in order to catalyze his journey, yeah. right? So it's like she gets murdered or raped and then disappears and then he's out here being a hero, right? And that's how people interpret scripture, that the dudes are always the heroes and the women are these sort of side characters. But I don't think that is actually what is happening in this story. And so I want to offer that there might be a third way. Maybe it's not perpetual virginity. And maybe it's not dismissive, like her concerns are petty and small. We don't need to say she's perfect. We don't need to dismiss her. What if we say that Mary, like generations of women before and after her, actually knew what was going on? <laughs> maybe let's pretend that Mary understood who her son was because she's been there since the beginning. Let's say that maybe when the angel appeared to Mary and said, oh, favored one, and then she exegeted that into a brilliant piece of theological discourse called the Magnificat, that she's not some dummy who like 30 years later was like, wait a minute, what? That she is somebody with a theologically robust interpretation of her son and who he is. Let's remember, the angel came to her and interacted with her, that her cousin spoke prophecy over her, that the shepherds showed up and told her about the angelic choirs that they had seen, that the magi came bringing gifts, traveling from afar. Anna and Simeon acknowledged her baby in the temple. They, she saw her son teaching in the temple when he was just a boy. Let us imagine for a moment that Mary is not an idiot but that she's smart and insightful and has theological interpretation of her son. So maybe what is happening is that she has a robust interpretation of Jesus. And she, like many women, when she's in a situation, sees practical needs. That, and that's not wrong or little, that's important. And then at, when she's at this wedding and she sees that they're running out of wine, and it's not just because like she really believes that everyone needs to knock one back. It's because in this culture, it's a hospitality culture. So you're hosting people for days. So if they run out of, of wine, it's very shameful. So she can see that something is happening that's gonna impact a community that she's a part of. And she sees a spiritual solution. So she acts as the bridge between observing practical need and a spiritual response to that need. She lives at the intersection that women and particularly women of color have lived at for generations. We, we, <laughs> We live on this earth, and we are concerned with practical realities. And that's not something to be ashamed of. The other thing is, when he comes to his mom, what if he's not just dismissing her? One, I think the way we read woman, uh, in our culture right now, like if, you, you know, if your mom came up to you and asked you to do something, and you were like, woman, that would be real disrespectful. <laughs> But you need to know that in the Greek, there is no disrespect in the term. You need to know that when Jesus was dying on the cross and looked down and saw his mother standing there and was worried about who she would live with and who would take care of her, he said, woman. So it's not a dismissive term. It's an affectionate term. And what if Jesus isn't just dismissing her, oh, woman, my time hasn't yet come. We know that Jesus doesn't do miracles unless he wants to. We know that Jesus doesn't uh, do things because somebody else wants him to. So the fact that when Jesus performs a sign at the wedding at Cana, it's not be in spite of his mother, but can we consider that it is in partnership with his mother? That maybe his mom is 
exerting some influence on him. That maybe this unmarried 30-year-old dude like doesn't totally, isn't observing all the angles of the food prep situation at a wedding that he's attending. <laughs> and that his mom is opening his eyes up to a practical need. And his response to that is to actually meet that need. So instead of a situation, because we have to look too, we always act like Jesus and his disciples are the main characters. But when we look at this, who's the first person in this story? Who's the first character? On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus, his disciples, had also been invited. Think about that. If I was like, hey, everyone came to a party at my house. Lauren was there. And also Wayne was invited. What's that sound like? It lets you know that Lauren was like the priority invite. You did not, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Lauren was the priority invite, and then Wayne came too. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples had also invited. So maybe she's not a side character. Maybe she's a main character. And maybe she's not just an annoying, maybe she's not just an annoying lady who's bringing up insignificant things, but maybe she's a partner who sees an important need and brings it to Jesus' attention and that he actually is influenced by her. See, that's what patriarchy can't imagine, that a woman might have influence on Jesus? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Because even though there is a push-pull she turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. And he does create wine. So let's just imagine that she, it's not this extreme of purity and asexuality, and it's not this extreme of gender caricatures and women are just petty, but what if it's a theologically robust Mary? who is insightful about her context, that Jesus listens to, who partners with her son, who is a part of this miracle happening. And you know, after the miracle, it says, what Jesus did here in Cana was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. It doesn't say, and his mother believed in him. Why? Because she already knew. She already knew. So the disciples had a transformational experience, but she had a partnering experience. And afterwards, it says, after this, um, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. The order in which people are listed in scripture matters. And so when Jesus leaves, day one, his ride or die, his mom, is listed as the person first who goes with him, then his brothers, and then his disciples. This I want to offer is the third way, the way I think is truer to who Jesus is to interpret this passage and who I think Jesus, how Jesus interacts with women and who we are supposed to be outside of this patriarchal framework. I love who Mary is. She sees a practical need. She bridges to a spiritual solution, and then she gets the logistics in play. Because even when a miracle's going to, sometimes we're like, a miracle's going to happen, and we think we're just going to sit here and receive it. But she's like, a miracle's going to happen. Y'all going to have to move some pots of water to make this miracle happen. So there's this practical side. The supernatural and the pragmatic are always in partnership with one another. And I think Mary gets that, and she sees that. I saw, actually, I got to encounter some people who I think were, are doing amazing work at this bridging of practical to spiritual to logistical. About a week ago, I had um, the privilege of going down to El Paso. I, I wanted to learn a little bit more about what's happening on the border. So I went to El Paso, and the border city that's on the other side is Juarez. So I was able to go into Juarez and um, hear the story of some folks who are living in um, basically like shelters there. And... Uh, you know, you can read in the news, but it's different to hear for yourself. And so um, there was a couple of people who've been staying in the shelters who were kind enough to share their journey. And there's a lot I didn't know. You know, uh, particularly there was two couples there who uh, live in Michoacan, another part uh, uh, further south in Mexico. And in that state, in that area, there's basically cartels, these kind of gangs that run free there that basically force you to pay them money and the government's in their pocket so the government doesn't do anything to protect them and if you can't pay the money they will kill you and it's not hypothetical the guy on the panel had bullets in his chest and was in a coma for multiple weeks 
And one of the other couples that was um, sharing their story and the reason they had fled, they, while they were sharing, I was humbled by this. They handed us a picture. They handed us four photos: the guy's brother and three of his cousins, all men who were brothers, all in their caskets, because they all been murdered by these cartels. So, and they were all married. They all had families. Think about the m amount of trauma in one family losing four, you know, uh, heads of the family like that. So they fled, they fled for their lives to the border and they came to the United States and said, literally, we have to get out of our country to live. What do you think our country said? No. And so they've been living in shelters for months. Now I was there when actually the court decision came down that you don't have to stay in Mexico while you're waiting for your asylum uh, case to be heard. So people were literally trying to get across the bridge as quickly as possible and they were shutting down the bridges. That's the own thing, that's its own evil, that's its own evil. But I wanna share their story because when we asked, how can we honor the stories that you shared, they, were, they asked that we would share their story. And so I wanna say, share that with you here so that you know that's what's happening at the border. Also while I was in El Paso, I got to hear from three activists from Arizona, Alfonso Vasquez, Ricardo Zamedio, and Alicia Contreras. And um, man, did they, it, whew, they, were, they, were ju they just spoke a whole word into me. I don't know if you all remember about 10 years ago in Arizona, they were passing legislation that basically is like brown people stop and frisk. It's like, if you look undocumented, law enforcement can stop you. I was like in New York, it's like, if you look like maybe you committed a crime, we'd just be like, this is just legalized racial profiling, right? And it became t like terror to basically all brown people in Arizona because there was like a terrible sheriff. I mean, it just sounds like an old timey story if it weren't for the fact that like it happened just 10 years ago. So this, this group of young community organizers, at that time they were just high school students and this legislation was coming through to get passed and they were like, what can we do? And they're like, well, we're all Catholic, and so we know prayer. We know that prayer is our voice. So they're like, why don't we go to the steps of the government building and we'll just we'll pray there. And so that first night at the beginning of the week, like seven of them went there and like stood in a circle and prayed. And by the end of the week, there was 3,000 people praying on the steps of the building that this legislation wouldn't pass. The sad thing is, it did. And he, they were describing the experience and they said, there was 3,000 people there praying that the legislation wouldn't pass and a group of about 10 or 15 people who were there in support of it. And when the news got announced that the legislation had passed, they could see the crowd turning on that group of about 10 or 15 folks. And I was like, yes, yes, I could see that energy, absolutely. And then these, they said, as 17-year-olds, their response is not my response, but this movement was formed in prayer. They said immediately they circled up around those people and protected them with their own bodies because the crowd just started chucking water bottles at that section of the, of the crowd. And they literally circled and protected their enemies on the day that they got terrible news. And I said, okay, y'all are 17. You were seeking God. The legislation still went through. How are you not just so discouraged? And how did you not just give up? And they said, that experience was our baptism. And the testimony that they were giving was that they were saying basically a whole generation of Latinx leaders rose up out of that terrible legislation and are now leading their state. And so they said, you know, when 2016 came, everyone was like sad and they were like, we weren't that sad because it was already terrible in Arizona. But we were actually encouraged because by that point, people who had started out with us 10 years ago we were voting them in as our representatives. And they said that they were, um, you know, that they, their community organizing work hasn't stopped and that they set a goal of registering 70,000 voters. And that when they held a press conference and said, told the press that that was their goal, they literally were laughed at. But as of a week ago, they have registered 180,000 people. <laughs> And I think that they're an amazing glimpse because they just keep talking about how prayer is at the center of it. 
They were like, we started out praying on the steps, and whenever we meet our legislators and we're like trying to appeal to them, we, we walk up to them, and they've done this in D.C., and they do this all over Arizona, and they're like, how can we pray for you? We're going to pray for God to move in your heart about this legislation, but also how can we pray for your family? And I was like, y'all be like saved in the name of Jesus. I'm over here riding like the anger train of cynicism, and y'all are over here putting hands on your literal enemies and praying for them with all sincerity, and th they challenged me, but they saw a need, they sought a spiritual solution, and then they executed the logistics of making it happen. Because I think 180,000 registered voters is a miracle. I think it is a miracle. So what do we do with this lingering legacy of patriarchy? When we're in these contexts that say that they support women in leadership, I think one of the really important things has been, and I feel like it, I, ha I have to, I wish I could be up here and just be like, men, stop doing patriarchy. But I think one of the things that's really hard is to, as a woman, to realize a lot of the work is, I have a lot of internalized patriarchy. That sometimes someone doesn't even need to say something to me to silence me, I silence myself. Sometimes I dismiss my own opinion. Sometimes I take myself out of the room before someone else takes me out of the room. Sometimes I don't even walk into the room. Literally, this has happened. I'll see a room full of pastors, and I'll just walk past. I don't feel like I belong there, even if they're not doing anything. We all have to work through the way these systems have internalized. And it's humbling to have to say that. Do you know what I mean? I wish I could just be like, but it's. So one of the things that I, it's been really important for me to articulate is the way that patriarchy makes us label things about women, about our bodies, about things we do as not good, especially in Christian spaces. You know, like our bodies are still sort of considered unclean. Like we don't use that language, but if you really think about it, it still goes down this way. And I'm going to share some categories that I have pondered. For example, it's okay for Kim Kardashian to put her cleavage all out in these streets if it's for heterosexual male consumption. That's not unclean. But a woman trying to nurse and feed her children in public, that's unclean. When a woman wants to talk about her period or sexual desire or pleasure or abortions, that's all unclean. But locker room talk's not unclean. And having affairs is not unclean. And having multiple wives and committing adultery is not unclean. And having multiple children and not raising them, that's not considered un unclean. Committing violence isn't considered unclean. Being a sex worker is unclean, but going to one isn't. <laughs> Who made these rules? Having a side chick is an unclean. Sending your junk in DMs is an unclean. Asking a woman you barely know to send you nudes isn't considered unclean. But if you keep your, ch if you keep your children in the car while you're trying to go get a job, that's considered criminal. And if you try to get housing for you and your family in Oakland, that's criminal. And your anger, our anger, is always treated as overly emotional. And all women in scripture are minimized, erased, and turned into periphery little characters, unclean and marginal. We need to continue to examine all the small ways that patriarchy dehumanizes and minimizes us. And the ways that we as women might sometimes agree to it, even if we don't want to. Mary was a theologian in her own right, a woman of God in her own right, who theolo theologized her own lived experience and I think partnered with her son in the performing in his, of his first miracle. Jesus does not dismiss his mother. He does not disrespect his mother. He is influenced by her. What if Christianity wasn't meant to be an instrument of patriarchy, but a place that liberated women, that took their insights and influence seriously, that took our concerns and our observations about the world and what is needful seriously? And what if we have direct access to Jesus and he takes us seriously? If you are a man with any leadership or authority, a manager, a director, a supervisor, a big brother, a father, a pastor, would you please sit and really interrogate the ways that patriarchy is bringing its influences into the spaces that you have influence in? 
and to deeply consider ways that you might be dismissing the input of women. And I think for us as women, can we continue to do this work to get this purged out of us in the name of Jesus? Part of why I think these belong circles are important is because patriarchy tries to keep men from building deep relationships of intimacy with each other. And patriarchy tries to keep everybody from vulnerability and real intimacy. And patriarchy keeps us from having real understanding with one another. I want to really invite you to consider being a part of one of these groups for the next couple of weeks because it's through the sharing of real story that I think we can begin to do some of this work. And this is what I'll say. I think that Jesus was influenced by his mother. And I think when Jesus gets to the end of his life and he looks at his mother from the cross and he says, woman, and he thinks about how to meet her practical need when he says, you should live with this man, he'll be like your son and he'll look out for you, that that is him living in the influence of her legacy of seeing and meeting practical needs that are before him. And we want to be more like Jesus in that way. Amen? Amen. So I want to go ahead and ask us to take a little time to respond. I know that talking about patriarchy can often trigger painful memories. It can just be painful to think about how you've been impacted by this. And I just want to invite us to experience the ministering of Jesus. Because he loves you and he sees you. And there's been a lot of harm done, a lot of patriarchy executed in the name of Jesus. But I don't think that that is how it's supposed to be. What a powerful message. I can feel it in the room. It, it penetrated so many of us in so many different ways. And I think the invitation is always to allow God to penetrate. What I've learned in this journey is so many times when pain is triggered, it's an invitation for transformation. But you can't run from it. You have to sit with it and ask God to have grace with you as you sit with it. Can we, I was gonna say, can we appreciate our amazing sister, but the Spirit saying, no, you acknowledge her and take her out of the box and you say, my amazing vessel. So can we uh, uh, appreciate God's amazing vessel? So what, 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 I, what I've learned in this walk is that when you get tough messages like this, you have tough conversations so many times out of default because so many things are going on, we say, I'm going to put that to the side and I'm going to come back to it. But I think the invitation is to actually sit with this and talk about this with your family and like, because this, is, this isn't a conversation we have at all, especially in the church. Where truth be told, in my short walk in the church, I see this more prevalent than any place that I'm in. And I believe from talking to God about this because it's so prevalent in so many spaces, there's an unforgiveness. And it, when you have unforgiveness for something, you can become that thing that you have unforgiven. And so I feel like there's so much oppression that we have endured that you can become this you can have some of the same characteristics of those those oppressions that you receive and i believe that the church has come to a place where we have this patriarchal kind of way we're even reaching for white supremacy as some of my mentors say unknowingly unknowingly so i think the invitation is for us to sit with this conversation start to think about it a little bit more research it a little bit more and see how it's showing up in your life and see because when you start noticing it and you become aware you see it so you see it everywhere i still see it in me because i've been taught ways and i've been shown ways and i'm so happy now that i can just like i said earlier have my emotions i was told you don't cry as a man do you know how much we're holding in if we don't have emotions So my invitation to my brothers, which is so needed, is that we start to tear down some of the walls and tear down some of the way we've, we've been created. My son is back there, man, and I, 
I love the conversations I get to have with that young man about being okay with exactly who he is, all of him. And then not just talking to him about it, but showing him by my example. Because he got to see who I used to be. And so for him to see me, and I, I, I would pray that we would start to do our own work, brothers. It's a lot of work, because we've been taught so wrong. We've been shown so wrong. I couldn't transition because I didn't see what now is called healthy men. I didn't see it. So I, I pray that as we have a space where we have healthy men, we get to share healthy spaces. I pray that we, we be accountable, be accountable for all of the things we might have done unknowingly. But when you start becoming aware, start being accountable and ask, please sisters, forgive us. Forgive us some, for some of the pain we've inflicted. Forgive us for being missing fathers in our community. Forgive us because we are the reasons why you have so much pain and so much anger. Forgive us for carrying, you have to carry so many burdens on your own. And then for my sisters, the invitation is, like Pastor Ernest said, to continue to be aware of those in, internal conversations because of all the stuff that has been put on you and the places that you have been not invited into. As I read my Bible, I really, really, I'm mind blown how women aren't uplifted when Jesus used women so much in the Bible. God used women so much in the Bible. The woman at the well was literally the first minister. And, and none of this is uplifted, and yet we still got stale churches that say women can't preach for their pulpit. That is not of God. It's not of God. So as a, as a family, I just, I pray that we sit with this. This, this conversation and this, what our amazing sister taught today, it, it can be transformative when you start to really dive into this conversation and you start to have some conversations with yourself, with your family. It really makes better communities. It makes better individuals. Gracious God, thank you for being gracious with all of us as we've been in this journey. We ask today that this message sit in our hearts, Lord, and we dwell with it for a little while, a long enough to be uncomfortable to learn something. We know that there was so much here today, but I ask that if we just take a little bit of the meat from here and there, whatever you put on our heart, we work with it. I pray that there's healing in this, in this uh, teaching today, Lord. I pray that there's understanding and awareness. and Maybe somebody can identify, oh, that's what I've been experiencing. Or that's what I've been perpetrating. Lord, we ask you to sit this in our hearts so that we may be more like Jesus. More like Jesus. More of him and less of us, Lord. More of him. And my prayer for the church is that we will continue to come to the awareness of where we are not being like you, God. So that we may be continue to be the light that you have called us to be, the salt that you have called us to be. With this kind of tough assignment, we can't do it without your Holy Spirit. So we, we say, bring your Holy Spirit so that we can do this, Lord, because we can't do it in our own power. We will not even revisit this conversation in our own power, but let the Holy Spirit that is in this place continue to be with us so we may go deeper into this conversation so that we may see change, not just in us, but in our communities, in our churches, and in our world. There's only one name that we can pray this in, and that name is Jesus. We pray that in the most mighty name we know, in Jesus' name, amen.